Well, good evening. We are looking at the final chapter of our Bible study guide, Last Things First, by Graham Bainan. So we're in chapter 9, Living in Hope, and we're going to read Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 25, and that's the main passage that the questions are then uh, based on. So reading Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 25. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Let's firstly have a look at what Paul has been writing just before this passage. The eighth chapter begins with that fantastic statement, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We've been set free from the condemnation that our sin deserves. And instead we have the spirit of life. In fact, the spirit of God dwells within us. And Paul writes in verse 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The spirit of God unites us with the resurrection of Christ and that gives us a confident hope about our eternal future. The presence of the spirit also gives us confidence about our relationship with God now while we wait for that future to come to pass. Paul writes in verse 14 and 15, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit gives us assurance that we have been adopted into God's family, and we're thus able to pray to our Father in heaven. Paul then says that, if we are children, then we are also heirs. We have an inheritance in glory. And he says that another evidence of this will be our willingness to suffer for our faith. This is a very similar line of thought to the one we've seen recently in First Peter. For example, chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So that brings us to Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul's thoughts are already focused on our inheritance in heaven and our suffering on earth. And he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The contrast he's making is between present suffering and future glory. And he says that there is no comparison between the two. As a very simple illustration, imagine receiving two letters in the post. One contains a bill for a thousand pounds and the other contains a check for one million pounds. One vastly outweighs the other. And that is how Paul views our future inheritance in heaven when compared with our present suffering. In verse 19, Paul writes that creation waits with eager longing 
for the day that the sons of God are revealed. Remember, he has just said that all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So he's writing about the day when Jesus Christ returns and under the authority of Christ's judgment, the division of all humanity takes place. When those who trusted Christ as their king are revealed as they rise to be with him and to live in his kingdom, and those who rejected Christ are condemned and shut out of his kingdom forever. Why is the creation waiting for that day? Paul writes in verse 19 that the creation has been subjected to futility. This is Paul's way of describing the curse that creation has been under because of sin. There's no escaping it. He writes in verse 21 of creation's bondage to corruption. Everything is bound to decay. Everything has an expiry date. And the reason for that is sin. We're told in the book of Genesis that God looked upon creation and saw that it was good. But when the first people, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God, God placed a curse upon them and upon their home, the earth and all of creation. In spite of sin's curse, there is hope for the physical creation because God promised a rescuer one who would crush the serpent's head. And this promise, therefore, offers hope not only to humanity, but also to their home, the earth and all of the creation. Paul has written earlier in this chapter that Christians have already been set free from condemnation. But we certainly haven't received and experienced everything that God has promised. We have an inheritance that is reserved for us in heaven, and we are waiting for the day when we will receive it. Paul describes part of that in verse 23, when he says that we are waiting for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We saw earlier in the chapter that we are already sons of God because we have the spirit of God the spirit of adoption. But there's a final stage to that adoption process that is yet to happen. Our bodies have to be changed and made fit for eternal life in heaven. We read of this more explicitly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 to 53, where Paul describes what will happen to us at the return of Christ from heaven. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. We will be resurrected with bodies purged of sin and equipped for the eternal holiness of heaven. We won't have to worry about an expiry date ever again. We are already free from condemnation, but one day we will be free from sin itself. And here in Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us that the physical creation will join us in our freedom. The creation will be set free from sin and from the curse. So the similarity between us and the creation is that we share the same hope, but we also share the same waiting time. Hence Paul describes creation as groaning, as if in childbirth, a mix of the experience of suffering alongside the expectancy of joy. And we can relate to that. We have the first fruits of the Spirit, verse 23. For example, we have gifts that the Spirit has given us now that enable us to serve and encourage others within the church community. But like the creation, we groan inwardly as we wait for that final day when God will complete the work he has begun in us and make us fit for eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. We have the experience of suffering alongside the expectancy of joy.
we can see that a major cause of our suffering in this life is the curse of sin on creation. But part of God's rescue plan is to bring an end to the curse through the victory of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we are to look forward to and wait eagerly for the, that final day, the day of Christ's return from heaven. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 10, which will also help us to answer this question. Paul begins by describing the human mortal body as a tent. And notice also that Paul mentions again how we groan during this life. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 10. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Paul uses the image of a tent to describe our mortal body, the body that is affected by sin's curse. In verse 2 he says, In this tent, that's our mortal body, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. We want to have that redeemed and resurrected body, the body that is fit for eternal life in heaven. But what has God already given us? Verse 5, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So just as in Romans chapter 8, Paul points out the importance of the presence of the spirit of God in us. The spirit is more than evidence of our future he is a guarantee of it. He is a guarantee that as children of God, we have an inheritance waiting for us. So when Paul writes about hope, it isn't the kind of hope that most people talk about today. Usually if someone today says they are hoping for something to happen, it means they want it to happen, but they really aren't sure it will happen. That's not how Paul uses the word hope. He is describing something he is sure will happen. He says in Romans 8 verse 24 that hope that is seen is not hope. So the hope we have as Christians is something definite, something guaranteed, but not yet visible. Hence, as Christians, we walk by faith and not by sight. But we have a confident hope because of what God has already given us. He has given us the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important for us to think through and understand what God has already given us because of our faith in Christ. Doing so will strengthen our hope. But it's also worth remembering that although we haven't seen our future inheritance, others have. The first followers of Jesus Several hundred of them met him after he had died and risen again. They witnessed firsthand the evidence of their inheritance, the evidence of a life forever beyond the reach of death. And they immediately began to tell others about it and then wrote it down for us. It's good to remember that the New Testament doesn't present us with just the idea of eternal life or a philosophy about it it presents us with a testimony 
from those who met the risen Christ. In both Romans 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul describes us as groaning while we wait for that final day. He recognises that life in this world is not always easy. We do suffer and we aren't to pretend that we don't. But we know that for those who trust their future to Jesus Christ, there will not just be a final end to suffering, there will be the blossoming of joy forever. So Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 25 that we are to be patient because we have a confident hope about the future, an eternal future in which we won't just rest in peace, we will worship in peace forever in the light of God's glory. The Bible is very clear. The future is guaranteed. Those who trust and follow Christ will one day be where he is, in the kingdom of heaven. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is one guarantee of that. We can have a confident hope of entry into the kingdom, even though we haven't yet seen it. As an illustration, my parents are in the process of buying a new home and are hoping to exchange contracts tomorrow. They've already seen where they're moving to, but until that exchange has taken place, they can't be absolutely sure that they'll end up there. But when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, it's the other way around. We haven't yet seen where we're going, but the exchange has already taken place. Christ died in our place on the cross. He has taken away our guilt and has given us the Holy Spirit. Because of what Christ has done, our future is guaranteed. The Bible gives us realistic expectations about the present. Among all the victories of faith, there will still be suffering because we live in a world that is cursed by sin. But that curse will one day be brought to an end forever. As Christians, we can have a confident hope about the future because of what Christ has done for us through his death and resurrection. And that can give us strength and peace during the struggles that we face in this life and can help us to remain patiently faithful to the Lord. Firstly, we can pray for greater confidence about our eternal future. Like the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 to 19, you can pray for yourself and for others that you would know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. Last Sunday, I spoke about the confidence we are to have in the gospel and its power to save. Let's pray this evening that as Christians, our confidence in the gospel and therefore our confidence about the future for those who believe the gospel would grow and develop. This series of studies has hopefully shown us how helpful it is to read the scriptures, to read the Bible and think about what we've read. So another way we can encourage and develop our hope of eternal life is to make a regular practice of reading the Bible and thinking about what we've read. There are many Bible study guides that can help us to do that. So if you want to get a study guide and want some advice about your choice, talk to someone else in the church, for example, an elder or an elder's wife. Finally, our hope is encouraged through our commitment to a local church where we can receive fellowship and teaching. 
right now our opportunities to meet together in person as a church are very limited. So we need to give even more importance to the opportunities that we do have, to the live streams and Zoom rooms, to the teaching and prayers happening online, and to the op other opportunities for fellowship, even if it's only in twos or threes, or chatting on the phone, or even chatting across a garden fence. Having fellowship encourages our hope. And I'll close with these words from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25, that speak of the day, that final day when Christ returns and faith becomes sight. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near.